With the war in Ukraine now beyond the 100-day mark, some Western capitals are pressing harder for peace talks to bring the fighting to an end. In Europe, unity over Ukraine has passed its peak with divergence in the EU over the continued supply of weapons to Ukraine. So what will it take to bring the fighting to an end? What are the pathways to peace? I discuss this with one of Germany's most seasoned diplomats, Wolfgang Ischinger. Uh, Ambassador Ischinger, it's uh, good to see you and a great pleasure to be talking to you at this time. What do you make of Russia's recent gains in the Donbas? Uh, is, is Russia likely to achieve its new stated objective of, of taking the entire Donbas region? Well, first of all, uh, let's be clear that Russia's original war aims have, of course, not been reached. Uh, the original idea was obviously, from all we know from President Putin's own statements and, and other statements, uh, was to, uh, uh, to conquer Ukraine, to get rid of, of Ukraine as, a, as an independent uh, country. So that obviously has not been achieved. Uh, the limited um, forward movement which Russia has been able to score in recent days in the Donbas region uh, is not the end of the story. Uh, it is uh, a limited advance. Uh, uh, it costs uh, enormous uh, efforts by the, by the Russian army, um, and it has not uh, been a decisive uh, movement forward. So I think that we are at, the, at this moment at a kind of stalemate in the Donbas region. It's very difficult even for military experts to predict whether in coming days or weeks this will really harden into a kind of a long-term war of attrition. Mm. Remember World War I where uh, armies stood opposing each other for many months at enormous cost of lives and 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 uh, and 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 and, fi and financial expenditure, etc. Et so uh, it's very difficult to say how this will develop. But I don't think that it would be um, reasonable to conclude that Russia, you know, is about to win. Russia is not winning this war at all. Russia may be consolidating its current control over the Donbas region, right, uh, right. but that would be a very, very limited achievement. That would be not much more than what they got in 2014-2015. Right. right. And, and, and on that point, uh, Ambassador, some observers say that if the Ukrainians were to be given the heavy, the heavy weaponry that they're calling for, that the tide could turn in their favor. But we've got to point out that the big powers, and chief among them is Germany, appear to be hesitant on that. Why is that the case? Why are we seeing a hesitant Chancellor Olaf Scholz at a time when the world is looking to Germany for that kind of leadership? Well, I will grant you uh, absolutely that uh, the German response to the demand uh, for he uh, heavy w weapons by the Ukrainian leadership has been slow, has been hesi hesitating. But the main point here is let's not overestimate, let's not overrate the relative importance of whatever German contributions may be able to be provided or may not uh, come about. The main bulk of the help which Ukraine has been receiving um, not only since the start of the military campaign, but even earlier, of course, has come from the United States and from others. So if Germany is now beginning to be a, a, a little more forthcoming regarding heavy weapons that may contribute to the relative strength of the Ukrainian ability to defend their territory or to make advances, but it is it is not a decisive factor. So let's not over over let's not blow this german question out of proportion it's it's a relatively minor issue in the in the in in the overall um, uh, in the overall equation of the balance of forces all right i i want to talk to this this western resolve this this unity that we saw 
uh, right at the beginning of this invasion, the cracks are starting to appear. Uh, indeed, in the European Union, you've got different camps that have now emerged. Uh, you've got Poland and the Baltics, and I'll add the Britons there, although they're not no, no longer in the European Union. Uh, and then you've got the big powers. You've got Germany, you've got France, uh, you have Italy calling for, for, for peace negotiations, calling for an immediate end to the fighting. What kind of peace is possible between Ukraine and Russia right now? And, and how can that peace be achieved? Well, look, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a former peace negotiator myself, I know a little bit about the conditions to go from war to peace. In the current situation between Ukraine and Russia, meaningful peace negotiations will only be possible once both parties, and I insist on both parties, Ukraine and Russia, come to the conclusion that they can no longer make meaningful advances on the battlefield, that they cannot win this war. Right. Only if they both uh, accept the idea that this is about as far as we can get, and maybe it is now a smart idea to write this down, whatever we have at this moment, because it's not going to get any better. Right. Uh, are we at this moment now? No, we aren't. Uh, obviously, Russia believes that they can still make meaningful right. further advances in the Donbas region. Uh, obviously, Ukraine is absolutely determined not to let that happen, but to try to push back the, the Russian army uh, at least to where the, the line of contact was in way back in, in February before the conflict started and maybe even, even further. So we are not at the moment where I would say meaningful peace negotiations <coughs> can be conducted. Right. Is, it, is it a good idea for major powers like France, Germany, the United States and others to keep talking to President Putin and to demand that he withdraws his army from Ukraine and that peace negotiations should be started. Of course, it's a good idea to do that. But we know that the moment has not yet come for that to happen. But, but demanding and, and, and increasing the pressure on the Russians to, um, to stop the war, because it's a war which they conduct on the territory of another state. It's not a war in Russia. It's a war conducted by Russia in Ukraine. And this is why Russia needs to right, stop right. and withdraw. Okay, so does it make sense then for Western allies to give Ukraine offensive weapons, given what you're saying? Well, I certainly do. I, I, I think that um, it is um, absolutely correct when President Zelensky says uh, this war will be de decided on the battlefield. Uh, it is a matter of weapons and of men, uh, of, of war fighting capacity, whether at the end of the day, um, the diplomatic solution, the diplomatic outcome will be one that would involve the loss of major parts of Ukrainian territory, yes or no. So it matters whether Ukraine can not only defend what they have, but regain what they right. lost. And that, and this is why um, uh, the, um, the, the procurement of, uh, of the necessary weapons and ammunition and, and intelligence, etc., mm. is, of course, of paramount importance. Absolutely. Let's talk about the negotiations. You ended off on the note about territory over there, Ukraine taking back what it's lost. Um, but when it comes to negotiations, what needs to be on the table? Um, we know that Ukraine's offered neutrality, that it will not, that it will essentially abandon its ambitions uh, to join the NATO alliance. That's clearly not been enough uh, for the Russians. Does it ultimately mean then that Ukraine would have to be willing to cede some territory in negotiations aimed at achieving peace? Well, again, I think this, this depends totally on what the territorial situation will be at the moment when meaningful, uh, serious negotiations 
uh, will be will be conducted. Uh, I hesitate to take it for granted to taking it for granted that Ukraine shall forever uh, relinquish its ambition to join NATO. Uh, it's true that uh, President Zelensky uh, uh, hinted at that, mentioned a neutrality as a as, as a possibility, but uh, that concession has not yet been made. And whether it is smart or not so smart for Ukraine to offer such a concession in advance, uh, well, let, let's wait and see what actual negotiations will lead to. Look, Ukraine will, regardless of what outcome, what concrete territorial outcome uh, will be obtained, Ukraine will will definitely need internationally relevant, credible guarantees for its future territorial integrity. And whether that can be uh, achieved without Ukraine being a member of the NATO alliance is a good question. I am not so certain that uh, uh, any kind of guarantee short of NATO membership uh, would would offer Ukraine the same kind of security as eventual uh, membership in the North Atlantic Alliance. So my advice to uh, all the uh, the observers and certainly to my Ukrainian friends is um, don't make any uh, concessions okay. uh, verbally or otherwise. Now uh, keep uh, your options open. And uh, uh, let's go to the negotiating table with all options on the table once the other side is also willing to seriously negotiate. That's uh, the idea. And I think that we will, of course, need a negotiating framework that will not limit uh, the participation to Russia and Ukraine. There will be some kind of framework that would involve maybe the permanent five of the UN Security Council, maybe involve uh, the European Union, maybe involve other neighboring states. Think of Turkey, think of the EU, think of right. uh, Poland, uh, et cetera. So I think we, we will need some kind of an international contact group arrangement in order to help uh, meaningful negotiations uh, being taken to a, con to, a, to a successful conclusion with actual sign signatures being affixed to it and, um, and ratification procedures being, being introduced. It's a complicated process, ending a war and turning it into peace. Uh, Ambassador, as, as we're drawing <laughs> to the close, um, I just wondered how could Ukraine's position be strengthened in those negotiations and, and how could the West help with that? Does it ultimately come down to what happens on the battlefield? Well, the first point that I would make is um, uh, it is, of course, obvious even now after about three months of, um, uh, of, of war fighting uh, that Russia's, the, the ability of the Russian army to, to conquer a large country like Ukraine is uh, very limited, and that uh, Russia has uh, uh, overstretched itself in terms of its original war aim. In other words, it's it's pretty clear, for me at least, even now, that Russia will actually have lost this war at the at the end uh, of the day. Whether they will be in control of some. Uh, part of Ukrainian territory, yes or no, that is, in my view, a minor question. The, the important uh, point to make is that Russia uh, has not been able to, and obviously, quite obviously, is not going to be able to dominate all of Ukraine and to subjugate Ukraine, to turn Ukraine once again into a kind of a vassal uh, of, of, of uh, under Russian control and Russian leadership. That's the essential point, and that that means that uh, Russia will have to go into a painful process of re-evaluating its own capacity as a great power, uh, whether it is in the interest of the Russian citizenry uh, to conduct expensive wars in Syria 
uh, in places like like Ukraine, with tens of thousands of uh, young Russian soldiers uh, dying for no discernible good reason at all. Um, no one pro no one attacked Russia. No one threatened to attack Russia. So I think there will be a moment of reckoning for Russia. Maybe not in the in the immediate future, while President Putin is conducting this campaign. But I'm absolutely certain that in the longer run, uh, in the medium and longer term, there will be uh, there will be these serious questions being asked by the Russian public in the Russian. Uh, uh, among the Russian political class, and it will be uh, a very difficult and painful process, I would right. imagine. Ambassador Ishinga, just to bring us back to what this ultimately is about, this is the invasion of a sovereign country, an invasion that actually began in 2014, if, if, if we're going to look at the facts. Um, because Russia is a nuclear power, uh, does, does that ultimately mean that Ukraine has to make peace with the fact that it may have to do away with some of its territory. Is that what this comes down to? Well, I would not, I would not automatically conclude that because of the, uh, uh, the fact that Russia happens to be a nuclear power, uh, Ukraine will, will be forced to give up uh, territory. It is one specific question, which is which has been hotly debated. Of course, um, is it possible for Ukraine, for example, to reconquer Crimea? Well, there are many voices out there in the West and elsewhere which say, well, the Crimea question is probably better left to future negotiations between Russia and Ukraine rather than waging a war about that at this moment, uh, given the fact that uh, that Russia considers that now, for, since 2014, a part of Russian territory. And that would mean that we would be looking at a war not in Ukraine, but a war in Russian territory. And uh, if you have a war on Russian territory, uh, Russia could claim that existential issues are at stake for Russia, because its territory is being threatened, and that therefore it is to be expected that uh, Russia would would be uh, would consider escal escal uh, escalatory steps uh, using, if you wish, uh, you know, at the end of the day, nuclear weapons to defend its own territory. So the Crimea question, in my view, is a very complicated one, and I I would simply uh, not come to the conclusion that any of these issues should be pre-decided by the outside world. We should leave it to the two parties. Right. Uh, we should leave it to the, the battlefield as it, as it evolves. And we should do whatever we can to make sure that Ukraine can uh, reconquer the territories lost since the 24th of February as a minimum. And whether they can go further than that will remains to be seen. And then hopefully we can, we, the international community, can be helpful in bringing about right, a right. diplomatic end, a peace settlement that is equitable and that will not produce yet another uh, uh, effort at war by either side. Ambassador, you've spent years as, as a diplomat. Uh, you have met uh, Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. You have seen many wars over the years uh, in your time. I wondered, when you look at what's going on in Ukraine right now, indeed, when that announcement came in February that Russia would be invading Ukraine, what did you think? What came to mind? What lessons do you think you've learned looking at all of this? Well, what I have uh, learned, what and, and what um, what surprised me so uh, so much was that there must have been a massive misreading, a, a massive misunderstanding uh, within the Russian leadership of what has happened in Ukraine over the last decade or so. Uh, 
It was true maybe 10, 15 years ago that Ukraine was just a little brother of Russia and, and did not really have its own fully developed national identity. But ever since 2014, everybody who has spent time in Ukraine, and I have spent time in Ukraine um, in, in, the, in the months and years since, everybody who's been there understands that Ukraine has changed dramatically. Uh, Ukraine looks at Russia now no longer as the big brother, but as the enemy, as the power which threatens the very existence of my country, of Ukraine. And I think uh, the fact that that was not understood in Moscow when, they've, when the decision was made to invade, when, when apparently the assumption was that uh, Russian tanks would roll into Kiev and would be welcomed by the population as a liberating force. Wow, what a dramatic miscalculation that was. So I think that one of my central conclusion would be uh, Governments are well advised to make sure that they don't only listen to their own, you know, uh, the gut feeling. Uh, uh, what, what I don't know how, how President Putin arrived at his conclusions, but that governments need uh, intelligence, intelligent advice from partners, from parliaments, uh, from advisory bodies. And if Russia had made any use of such of, of such elements, of such help, they would certainly not have decided to attack. What a disastrous mistake that was. And for the West, what are the lessons learned? And for the West, of course, uh, we must relearn the idea of deterrence. In a way, you know, deterrence by the West of Russia has failed. Uh, obviously, the sanctions which we enacted after 2014 did not uh, sufficiently deter Russia from thinking, well, uh, maybe we can not only do that again, what we did in 2014, maybe we can take it a step or two further. So <clears throat> our deterrence effort failed, and we must rethink how we can strengthen our own ability to deter and to defend our interests, our borders, whether this is the EU, or whether it's NATO, uh, or whether it's uh, individual countries. Uh, the idea, which was very popular in my own country, in Germany, for the last 30 years, the idea that we are now going to be enjoying forever the peace dividend, uh, that idea is, of course, now, um, uh, out, you know, has gone out the window. We, uh, we need to accept the idea, the fact that war has returned as an instrument of politics to the European continent. And that is why defense, military capacity, and deterrence, whether we like it or not, are back on the table as very important elements of our, of our own existence. My final question, Ambassador. <coughs> what are your, your thoughts about Vladimir Putin? Um, is, is anything that peace negotiation would be aimed at achieving, uh, can, 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 can people rely on that if Vladimir Putin is still in charge at the Kremlin? Is, is he the factor here? The problem, of course, as I see it, is that um, there is no, uh, is that, that there is one man rule in, in Moscow. Uh, in, the, in, in, in the Soviet days, uh, they had a politburo, they had a central committee, uh, they governed by committee, in, if you wish. Uh, the Putin system is, is a system where one man exactly, uh, only one man makes the decisions, and that, of course, is particularly uh, dangerous for any country, and especially for a large and important global power such as, such as, as Russia. I think that whatever outcome uh, will be possible to this war, it, it, will, it will need very, very strong international guarantees. Uh, I think it would be foolish to rely on verbal or written declarations by the Russian Federation 
led by President Putin after all the deception, mm. the misinformation, the disinformation uh, that we've uh, gone through in, in recent months and years. So I think uh, the trust, trusting Russia, uh, will actually become possible only in a post-Putin era, I would imagine. Ambassador Ishinga, as always, thank, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. Great, great talking to you. I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. <laughs>